Coming up next, we have this exciting panel discussion titled Alternative Capital Sources and Structures Gain Steam Amid Funding Winter. And to lead this exciting discussion, I'd like to invite, first of all, the editor for VC Southeast Asia at Deal Street Asia. Let's welcome Christy Neo. Thank you so much. Christy will be our moderator. And joining Christy on the stage, let us welcome also Donald Rihaja, CEO MDI Ventures. Joining Donald on stage, we also have Paul Ong, partner, Innovan Capital Southeast Asia. We also want to invite to join them Joshua Augusta, Executive Director, Vertex Ventures, Southeast Asia and India. Joining them also is Fandi Chandra Jaya, Partner, Corporal Network. And rounding off this exciting panel, we have Jessica Huang Puller, Partner, Open Space Ventures. Thank you so much to our esteemed panelists for joining us for this exciting panel discussion. Without further ado, Christy and panelists, over to you. Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Can, can everyone hear me? Hello? Ah, uh, yes, okay, cool. Okay, can you hear me? Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here today for Deal Street Asia's Indonesia PEBC Summit. I hope you guys had a wonderful networking and a coffee outside. Um, I am joined by very distinguished panelists today, and the title of today's uh, panel discussion is Alternative Capital Sources and Structures Gaining, Gaining Steam Amid Funding Winter. Uh, there's no better way to kick off the conversation uh, than to kind of get a bit of an overview in terms of how the fundraising climate has been um, since 2022, especially since the market turned in the beginning of last year to now. Um, and my first question will go out to all of you. Let's start, maybe we'll start with Jessica first. Um, you know, just some, some thoughts in terms of um, the out fundraising climate in 2022, uh, in terms of equity fundraising last year, um, and how do you see 2023 shape up um, as we start the new year? So first of all, thank you very much, Christy, Deal Street Asia, for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. It's also just so wonderful to see a room full of so many people uh, here in Jakarta and excited to learn a little bit more about what's going on across the technology ecosystem. I mean, I don't think it's any secret the market has slowed considerably this year, especially in comparison, certainly in comparison to 2022, but especially in comparison to 2021. Um, it, it, is, it has become harder for startups to raise capital. It's become harder for VCs as well to, to raise capitals from limited partners. But that said, venture capitalists in the region still have dry powder. And so their deals will get done this year, but I think the big difference is the bar is going to be higher. There's going to be more discipline around uh, making sure that companies are, are, are building really you know, truly good business models that are able to generate revenue and, and profit. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot more moderation around valuation too, and we'll, I guess we'll get into structure. I think structure plays a part um, in that as well. But uh, in spite of the market slowdown, I think there will be deals. Deals will get done. It's just going to be in a more moderated pace than it has been in the past. Mm. Um, next question maybe for you, Donald. I mean, how, how different is the cost of capital today? versus maybe 12 years ago, or 12, 12 months ago, not 12 years ago. <laughs> 12 years ago, uh, we're still good, better than yeah. 12 years ago. <laughs> but uh, uh, just uh, for 12 months ago, uh, just uh, before the, the start of this winter, yeah, yeah. Um, we're still seeing deals. Uh, I was just talking to in one of the vertical 
that uh, they, they still see um, uh, 10, 15x uh, revenue as low, right? Whereas uh, where 20 something is, is more normal. And now I'm, I have to tell them that uh, you know, the market right now would support a three, maybe 4x revenue uh, valuation. Um, as uh, uh, Jessica said, the dry powder is available, but there is an uh, adjustment in the perception of what's the value of your company, even if your company is doing well. And I have to say that uh, the majority of my, uh, my startup are doing well in terms of uh, generating still 2x growth uh, year on year on their, uh, their performance KPI, if you consider revenue, that's, that's the KPI, right? But in fundraising, we need to reconcile what the founder are willing to accept. Yeah, uh, that kind of multiple we're talking about. I do very well. How come it's still a down round for me? Yeah, with the market, what the market, uh, with investors in the market, are willing to pay, and we can't certainly pay double, triple what the market would bear. Yeah, or yeah, you know, it's not responsible for us to do that. So. At some point, and hopefully the last 12 months, people are getting to realize, okay, the new market, this value is more acceptable, or some kind of structuring need to be done, debt and uh, equity mix, etc., so that we can come up to an agreement about what uh, they're willing to take for what price. Yeah. We all. haven't actually seen that many... Um down rounds as of yet, at least like publicly for us in a, in, in a public space. I mean, maybe Joshua can kind of lead in, you know, in terms of what you've been seeing um, from your own portfolio as well as what you're seeing outside in the market in terms of, uh, we hear a lot about, you know, flat rounds being the new up round. Um, has that really gone mainstream in terms of what you're seeing or where, what, what is the shape, what is the pace, what is the, what is the outlook like on that particular front? Are we seeing a lot more of that moving into this year? My take on it, uh, I think early stage, uh, you will see less of that. Se early stage meaning like seed maybe up to series A. I think for now, in the current environment, it's like one of the best times to be like the founders, in my opinion. Or maybe to, if you have, uh, if you're early stage VC with like dry powder, you can find like good quality founders with uh, pretty much like lower valuation just because of the factors that Jessica and Donald has just said. Uh, the unicorns are laying off people and these people who are got laid, who got laid off usually they have good ideas that becomes like the unicorn mafia for you right especially in Indonesia so that's early stage I think in the growth stage you will see more of these dynamics uh, growth stage meaning series B plus uh, for example maybe we don't see down round per se but let's say uh, if we have like a 2x liquidation preference like <laughs> for example 2x liquidation preference actually on your books it can be like a 50% down run, you know, things like that. So there's a new, for example, CDC company uh, trying to raise, I don't know, maybe $100 million valuation, $100 million, $200 million at maybe $1 billion valuation. It's a 2x equation preference participating that need become like a, you know, 50% down run on your books, technically. It can be, right? Even though it's not necessarily a down run from the last round per se. So some technicalities on that can be critical too for uh, the existing fund managers. Um, you know, in this current climate where, you know, obviously cash and equity is uh, not moving as quickly as it was in 2020 and 2021, um, you know, I mean, in your opinion, which alternative funding methods do you think are most promising in this current climate? Sorry, I didn't get you. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. Just to repeat my question. So, as, as I mentioned, you know, 2020 and 2021, uh, boom time, lots of cash, lots of equity. We have entered a season now where that has kind of moderated somewhat. Are there any particular alternative funding uh, instruments that you think uh, could potentially fill the gap that maybe venture capital uh, may or may not be able to fulfill in this current market? Well, first of all, I think it depends on the stage and it depends on the sector that you're in. So I think if you're early stage, not so many options for you. Uh, because if you're looking for, for example, yeah, we're talking about equity versus debt first, and maybe Paul can expand on that later. Uh, usually, debt cannot come into like early stage, 
uh, startups just because of the risk factor. I mean, uh, you can ask him later what, what sort of metrics he's looking for, but you know, if you are like a new company, haven't really raised that much of money, you don't have that enough runway, usually it's really hard to even get the venture debt. Uh, especially, and then you want to you wanna talk to the banks or the other financial institutions in Indo, uh, it's going to be difficult. And especially uh, during the, this time, uh, interest rate is going high, yeah. uh, your debt can also be more expensive, yeah. right? But in certain businesses, for example, if you're in trading business, if you're in a manufacturing business, you will need this sort of, um, I would say, mix between equity and debt. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, because the rounds are getting moderated, the amount of fundraise is moderated. So for example, initially they plan to raise a 10 million US dollar uh, round, and then the 5 million is an allocation for the time deposit that you require for your debt. Mm -hmm. Maybe the good mix is you raise maybe five to $8 million in equity, and then maybe two to 5 million in venture debt or other you know, uh, financing options for you to be able to get that type of uh, working capital investments that you require. So maybe that can be an option, but always depend on your stage or it depends on your cash flow. It depends on what sort of businesses that you're in. So, so just to clarify also, I mean, uh, of course, uh, me and I guess uh, over here are kind of biased in the sense that we are VC and therefore the VC's methodology of investing is usually around equity or structured debt or something like that. Yeah, we, we are not bank, so we cannot do just uh, collateralized lending. Um, but uh, the alternative version of what we do is uh, we just structure, as uh, Joshua mentioned, with the liquidation preferences, with the warrants, with the options to allow us to still get our, uh, our uh, 3x, 2x uh, target multiple that our fund is supposed to deliver, right? Uh, yet understanding the reluctance of our, uh, especially uh, Southeast Asian uh, startups, to things that look like a down round. So there's a whole bunch of articles around, uh, even in Bloomberg, about uh, how you structure uh, technicalities, as you said, 2x, 3x liquidation preference, what that, that do to technical valuation of the round, yeah. even though the paper valuation is still flat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we can do X, that, right? 2x, 3x yeah. liquidation preference sounds pretty uh, steep. horrifying yeah. before. Like, pretty but they're going to have to take. Pretty aggressive, no? <laughs> yeah, you want a down round? <laughs> so that's the option, yeah. right? You can yeah. get that in this type of environment yeah. right now. We, yeah. we would rather do it in yeah. a real valuation down, yeah. right? But they won't take it. Yeah. So we have to come up with something that is, you know, middle in between, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, multi tranche. Uh, um, uh, liquidation preferences, warrant on the side, all that kind of stuff, or convertible notes with uh, uh, a cap and a huge discount. Those are methods we can use because at the end of the day, it's an equity. Uh, we, we play on the equity side, right? But there are terms. So we just have to play with the term to get the, uh, the fair valuation that we need, recognizing the market situation but at the same time, uh, uh, guaranteeing us the multiple that our investors uh, need. Yeah. But at the same time also, if they somehow manage to deliver uh, and use the money that we got, and that's what we hope anyway, uh, to grow, uh, uh, they will survive this with minimal uh, uh, dilution anyway, yeah. right? They, um, but only if they deliver, right? Uh, and if they don't, we will have our valuation adjusted because of all the structures that we put. Um, on MDI, uh, we are unique in a way that we are uh, 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 somewhat in between corporate and strategic venture capital. Even though we do raise money from external sources, not just from our parent corporate, um, we always uh, uh, have a team that built a relationship and build, uh, open the business opportunity of our mostly corporate LP to our uh, startup. So we also, uh, the other way we structure the deal is to uh, have um, somewhat more guaranteed growth path for our, our portfolio, who we identified have collaborative uh, revenue generating business between them and our parent. So we are basically a referral service and uh, Salesforce 
for our startup, and we don't ask for commission, we just ask for growth, right? because our commission will come from the valuation. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's one way we do it. Maybe just kind of jumping to Paul, since you know, you're the only venture debt player here. Um, how, he, he, Donald mentioned about you know, certain deal terms that have emerged in last year. How has that played into some of the transactions that you've done on the venture debt side that you've seen? Um, any new emerging uh, trends that you're seeing? And as we move into 2023, how do you see that kind of shaping up? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, firstly, generally, interest rates have gone up, right? So I think uh, in, terms of, in terms of our, you know, return profile, we do have to cater for that, and we have. Um, to be honest with you, I think with regards to, uh, you know, what, you know, Donald, Joshua, Jess, Fandi do with regards to their uh, investment structures, um, we, we don't really... And that matters less to us because ultimately for us, uh, you know, the cash flow is what matters with regards to the repayment of the loans. Um, as long as, you know, there's support from the equity investors, I think uh, Venture Debt's willing to sort of play a part and should play a part, uh, you know, in every uh, company's growth. Um, you know, in terms of what we do in our own structures, we keep it very simple. Ultimately, I think if you're talking about Series A, Series B companies, you know, these are still babies, right? Um, you know, they may not have a, uh, a fully, f like, fleshed out, uh, you know, finance team. You don't have a 20-year, you know, uh, veteran CFO. So the onus is on us to ensure that we keep, you know, the structure and the financial product as simple as it is for not just us to manage, but for the companies to manage such that the repayment risk is the, low, the lowest on both sides such that they can focus on business growth. And I mean, since, since last year, how has deal flow been for venture debt? I mean, I, I get the sense that there has been rising demand for a lot of venture debt services. Are there particular types of businesses that can take venture debt? Or, you know, is venture debt for everyone? I think is really the question. Yeah, so, uh, well, on the demand side, you know, I think we've definitely seen a uh, significant increase in at least the conversations we're having. Uh, you know, here at Innovan, we typically are Series A, Series B guys. Um, you know, but I think recently we've had a lot more conversations with growth stage companies who are willing to take smaller check sizes, um, you know, to, to sort of help them out with the rounds, etc. Uh, and a lot of this is not because companies are in stress situations or they're in, they're in trouble. Uh, but, you know, there is still a valuation mismatch between uh, what equity investors want uh, and what the founders want. So we are a way to, you know, reduce that dilution factor, whatever, you know, whatever decision that they end up with the, with the, uh, the equity investors. So demand definitely has been, uh, uh, you know, high. Um, with regards to the type of companies that should take venture debt or not, um, Actually, I do believe that debt has a part to play in every company. Every great company in the world, you know, has used debt to optimize their, their, their business. The key, you know, for us really is structuring, right? Are the debt structures the right uh, ones for your company? Unfortunately, if you look at earlier stage companies, uh, you know, and, and where uh, they are at in terms of the business maturity, there's not a lot of structures that they can optimize for just because you know they're still cash burning for growth uh, they're not in a position where you know they have free cash flow to sort of pay back uh, and so once again uh, you know the responsibility really lies in uh, you know any lender right now that wants to look at this space uh, with regards to how they make sure that they structure these uh, debt uh, uh, loans uh, correctly such that it works out for both lender as well as a, as a company. Um, next question for Jessica, maybe because you do have quite a number of growth stage companies in your portfolio. How have some of these companies been you know, tapping on? Have they been tapping on venture debt or any other deal structures that they've been uh, working on recently? How, and how have they been looking like? Yeah, so actually, maybe before I address that, um, I just wanted to give an additional comment to some of the um, feedback from both Donald and from Joshua. When we think about alternative sources of capital, I think especially in this market environment we're in right now, the primary focus first is on profitability as an alternative source of capital. 
I think in 2021 and 2022, there was a very big premium on top line growth. I think now there is a much bigger premium on the ability to generate profit. And if you think about, if you think about alternative sources of capital, the best source of capital, if you can produce it, is your own, using, utilizing your own profitability, right? Minimizes dilution. Um, you don't have to take on you know, debt. That, I think, is really the, the primary focus. And I, I think that's also why you see a lot of the tightening of operating expenses, which includes, unfortunately, um, cutting down on staff for a number of the companies, right? Is really, that is first and foremost the alternative source of capital that all of these companies are, are seeking for in order to extend their, their runways, their cash runways, right? So I think that's, that's number one. I think there's a, probably a little bit of a misconception that the technology companies in Southeast Asia are not experienced with debt, do not borrow. Actually, a lot of the fintech companies across the region, right, who are, have consumer lending arms, have very active dialogue, have, um, uh, have loan facilities with international and local banks. And so I don't think debt is a new concept to the technology companies in the region. I do think that there will be um, increased utilization of products like venture debt. I think it's, some of it is education, right? It's still a relatively new product to the region, but I think the other, the other element of it is also availability. Um, I mean, Paul, you're like, kind of like one of the only parties in, in town, you know? And so there's just not a lot of availability of, of venture debt for the, for the market here. And so I think part of it too is we need to work collaboratively with, with lenders like Innoven to, to um, to have debt structures that, like you said, work both as for the lender, but also for the borrower. Because I think there's still a little bit of mismatch there. Um, a lot of what we see as available debt options for early stage companies is still, you know, I would say, um, and, and I understand where you're coming from, where you try to keep it simple, try to keep it simple for everyone, but it's not necessarily bespoke to the needs of the startups. And so I think if we can have more collaboration from that front, there we will start to see a lot more uh, utilization of products like venture debt. And the other element I think that we probably don't talk about enough as well too is the vast majority of venture debt products are US dollar denominated. And that is, I think that's quite challenging in this kind of market environment where currency is uncertain um, and the cost of hedging is, is very high. And so that, that becomes an additional layer that needs to be factored in in addition to you know, security and the cost of cost of interest as well. Uh, I don't know if Andy wants to jump in into... I guess, um, so I'm usually involved in early stage investments and typically I guess for early stage investments, the alternative um, source of capital will be angel investments. Um, right now in Indonesia, having we're in the sort of the third wave of like unicorn founders and established founders, the first wave of like Goto and Bukalapak, and then now obviously with uh, Kopi Kenangan, um, Zendit, uh, and obviously Ajaib, the next wave, and then now we're entering the third wave. I think there are established founders that's actually able to uh, invest in early stage companies. And then obviously in uh, early stage companies, these um, angels have different re requirements to venture capitals in terms of investments, right? I think venture capitals, I think these angels will act as a funnel to the venture capitals later on, um, as in, as a way of deal flows. As a venture cap, I don't think there will be rounds happening. For example, last year, 12 months ago, there was a uncapped safe notes happening, uncapped convertible notes. I uh, don't think that's happening anymore anytime soon. Um, and then also with angel investors, I guess you are able, the early stage founders is able to test their product market fit first because typically angels have, angels have their own ecosystem, right? Uh, and obviously being able to be plugged in into the ecosystem will enable them to find product market fit and obviously will lower the risk as venture capitals come in later on. So, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe back to Paul, since um, you were just talking about venture debt earlier. Um, I mean, I just maybe jumping off what Jessica was mentioning. I mean, are there any, is there any possibility that, you know, maybe I, I, if you could kind of 
kind of elaborate a little bit more in terms of the flexibility of the products that you, men you were mentioning that has or has not been available till now. <laughs> that Paul not to call you out, but I mean, like local currency take some debt would be good. Um, <laughs> no, you know, more I, I flexibility around amortization. Um. No, look, I, I think uh, you know we, we definitely strive to uh, make sure the structures uh, work best for both company and ourselves. Um, but you know, I think we do. The, we, we really try and do the best we can with you know what's in front of us, right? And I think the in, in most situations, if you're still talking about early stage high growth, you are talking about companies that uh, you know uh, are cash burning, right? Uh, and are on a in a way limited runway basis. So yes, we can tweak the amortization, but that possibly comes at a cost. And a lot of it is just a matter of negotiation between us and what the company is also willing to accept. Um, on, you, know, you touched on uh, the fact that you know, a lot of debt funding in the region uh, is USD. I agree, I think there is a need for local, more local currency debt funding to startups in the region. Uh, but at the same point in time, you know, most of you guys are providing the equity checks in, in, in US dollar. Uh, and I know that most of the startups out there are not swapping, you know, the five, 10 million that they raise into, uh, fully into IDR, et cetera. Uh, and so we still look at it as the fact that based on, you know, your investments in your portfolio companies, there is a natural dollar hedge uh, for the companies, right? Given the fact that they are all still cash burning. So it's not as though their indoor operations is actually making, uh, you know, uh, net profits or EBITDA to, you know, sort of uh, pay back, uh, um, you know, rupiah for rupiah loan. Uh, so I, I do think that, you know, it, it, the optionality is good to have, but it doesn't actually add on too much to the currency risk factor, provided that companies are still raising in USD as well. Yeah. Is this something that maybe the state-owned players like BRI could potentially occupy in terms of launching more rupiah-specific products, perhaps? Um, well, uh, I can't exactly say for my counterpart in CVC that is uh, Himbara-based, yeah. uh, but I do Okay, what I can say, what I understand from, from our, my conversation with them is they do like to provide uh, assistance from, uh, for, from the start, to the startup to access and in discussion with their uh, bank that will get the, the uh, loan from the banking side. So, so good news is sometimes they can, they can also help you get in front of the, uh, the banks. Um, and provide, uh, they, they do the equity investment, of course. Uh, uh, MCI, BRI Venture, and everything else, they do the equity investment. But uh, it, they're pretty close to the, uh, the banking side. And if the startup has need that fit the credit criteria of the bank, then, then it may work. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that, because not everything has to be funded with equity. And in fact, if you are a financial, uh, a fintech company, a lending fintech company, you, you should as much as possible finance your debt side, not with equity, but with something else, uh, institutional debt or some, some sort, right? Uh, and it's just, that's, that's their necessary need for working capital. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, one interesting thing, to Paul, I think I've asked you before this long, some time ago, do you do uh, uh, venture debt that has to be paid on a monthly basis? Mm. Or do you do bullet at the end? And do you do the evaluation based on the cash flow of the company core main business? Yeah. Or do you expect that they can fundraise something bigger and pay you back at the end? Right? What, 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 would make a quali what would qualify a startup to get a venture debt as opposed to, for us on equity, is purely on valuation? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, firstly, it's, it's definitely a case-by-case case sort of issue for us. 
Um, so there, there are two things I think in the question that, that you had, which is regard to evaluation and the structuring. Um, on the evaluation side, you know, we actually look for uh, a lot of things that are similar to what, what you guys sort of look at, right? And I think for us, you know, it's not about, uh, it, it was never about, you know, companies that believe they can, you know, be profitable in three months, six months, etc. For us, it was about can these, continues, uh, can these companies continue to grow uh, such that you guys would, you know, continue to so support them along their, 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 their journey as well. Um, so, you know, the cap table does matter uh, to us a lot, right? Uh, because there are, um, you know, uh, partners like you guys who we all, we trust uh, and we would prefer to, to, to work with. Um, you know, runway and burn is something that we are, uh, you know, quite sensitive about as well. Uh, so, you know, preferably burn should be managed, burn should have uh, flexibility to, uh, you know, decrease on, on a monthly basis. So those are some of the things that we sort of look like at, at when we uh, evaluate uh, companies. Now, on the structuring side, uh, you know, repayments, flexibility, etc., that really comes down to uh, the way companies burn, their business model, uh, is there any seasonality, uh, as well as, as runway. And so that is really done more on a you know, case by case, uh, review by review basis uh, to, to see if that can work. What I can say though is that, you know, and, and Donald mentioned, uh, you know, potentially startups working with banks. I, I think the difference and, and one reason why there aren't so many, uh, you know, venture lenders around or, or lenders willing to lend to uh, early stage uh, is that, you know, we, we have spent a lot of time understanding uh, venture and the venture ecosystem, not just in Southeast Asia, but we've been operating in India for uh, over 10 years. We've been operating in China. So we take all that expertise across the different markets, um, you know, and you know, we learn from that. The last thing that you want is, or a company wants is to work with a nervous lender, right? If you go to a, a bank or someone that doesn't, doesn't understand the fact that you know, you are operating on a net burn basis and, you know, that you would still have to raise money, uh, you know, what do you think they're going to do nine months from now when your, your cash is at three months or four months, right? Will they ask to be repaid uh, immediately? So I think understanding uh, the industry, how these companies operate, how technology companies operate, how the investors operate, uh, is, is, it has been really key for us to essentially grow ourselves into probably, you know, the leading uh, venture that player in, in the current market. Yeah, I think just to expand on that, I spent some time in my career in state-owned banks as well, CVC uh, granted. So I think the usual structure that the startup use in working together with the banks is that they don't come directly to the banks, but the banks usually have like certain channeling uh, to the fintech players, right? Uh, so for example, when I was in Mandiri, during my time in Mandiri, we have certain a million dollars channeled through the fintech portfolios that Mandiri Capital has, right? So that's usually the play uh, in Indonesia. However, this structure is very uh, limited in terms of, uh, number one, the financial product that can be offered, which is, uh, you know, pretty much is uh, invoice financing, usually. And it's bounded to regulation that it can only be kept at 2 billion rupiah, which is, yeah, considering the currency today is around, is less than, uh, 150k US dollars. Yeah, we're, we're 10 to 15 percent poorer now. If we count it ourselves. Per in client US. of the yeah. startup, right? Yeah, per Not client the startup, of the startup. That's right. Per client of the startups, meaning that if the startups or the fintech is channeling the money uh, to their clients, and then the clients require more than that 150k ish, then there's nothing you can do about it. And that's number one. And number two, the, and the more fundamental thing is on the cost of capital itself. Because usually when the bank came to the fintech, they provide like maybe 11, 12% cost of capital. And considering the margin that the fintech took, maybe it will be 15%, 14% plus insurance, whatever, right? So the cost of capital itself is already really high, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, 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 in this part of the region uh, of the world, right? So unless that changes, and then there are certain regulation changes, 
uh, towards that cap, and I think the uh, I think the regulators are working on that. And there's emergence of digital banks here and there being bought by the fintech. I think that's the gap that uh, you know ripe to be solved, I guess, by certain innovation in that uh, in that uh, in that particular in that particular sector. So, um, maybe just a follow-up question, just again to Joshua sure. is um, I, I, specifically for founders. Um, uh, are there any particular deal structures that they can tap on to incentivize investors like yourself or even like OpenSpace and MDI to, to be able to invest in this current climate where equity is not as moving as quickly as before? There's no like, uh, you know, an, like one answer to everything, right? I always say that uh, I always and I always think that uh, you know uh, for 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 structuring, I think during these times uh, the rule of thumb is that, uh, uh, and I think this is like psychological. If you raise too much money, you tend to be like less capital efficient, and capital efficient is like one of the key things that we need to pay attention to, and that's what we're trying to do with our portfolio companies, right? So uh, capital efficiency is key, meaning that. Uh, if you need to raise, uh, raise the amount of money that you need, don't raise too much, right? Number one, protects your dilution. Uh, number two, uh, you know, it actually uh, provides you a, a basically a room for you to be able to be capital efficient, which is a good thing during this time of the, uh, during this time of the market, right? And as Jessica said, profitability, if you can achieve that, uh, you know, at least during the first half of this year, that will be great. So that's basically what we're trying to do. And there's no like silver bullet answer to what sort of structure that you know fits everyone, right? Um, for me, um, my emphasis emphasis is would be on um, focusing on the business that you know it you can do well, right? Um, raise, I would argue, raise more money than you need, actually, but be disciplined in what you use the money about, right? This is the good news is that you are you and your competitor are no longer burdened with uh, uh, cheap cash that every one of you should go and try to dominate as many market as possible that you even have a po remote possibility of winning just so that you won't be out competed by some other crazier startup next to you. Everybody will be very uh, conservative in using their money. So you need to focus the money that gives you a better proof that you know what you're doing in this business, right? Ideally, get to a profitable EBITDA positive. You get to EBITDA positive, the entire valuation game changes. You are among the elite company that can, be, that can have a runway of forever, right? I got a few of my company that we look at this thing and then the, the, the analysis is that runway, Whatever. Infinity, right? Runway infinity means, yeah, you want to fundraise, we'll give you money, no problem, right? But, um, uh, but if you don't uh, have that, yeah, you need to at least be able to show gross, gross uh, income, uh, gross profit uh, positive, right? That means outside of headquarter costs, every sales you do is profitable and preferably as big a, a margin as possible. So you can argue that at scale, I am profitable, right? Now we just have to manage how much you put into your headquarter, which means if we fire off all your IT for new product development, your company can run forever, but it's just not going anywhere, right? Um, but there is a, a longer runway solutions, and most likely you can raise money better from Paul because you can have a much larger debt servicing cash flow than otherwise, right? So, so the most important thing is we look, at, uh, we look now deeper into our portfolio and see how they're making up their revenue and where they're do, doing their burn. Yeah, make sure that it's reasonable and in an area that they can justify that there is return for this burn, right? Uh, do you want to leave Fanny out? You just wanted to yeah, get your thoughts. I guess, um, I guess one thing to add to that, I think uh, raising as much capital as possible and also finding the balance between uh, not optimizing the valuation very early on at least. I think early stage companies um, right today, founders are still 
some of the founders are still learning from what's happening in 2021. So all of them are still seeking like super high valuations. And, and eventually, um, when you raise a super high valuation early on, it will eventually catch up to you. So I think there's a fine line between optimizing valuation and not getting too much dilution um, from the early stages. Do you still see a lot of companies kind of over diluting themselves too Pardon? early? Do you still see a lot of founders over diluting themselves too early? I think early stage, I think I have an experience where early, um, one of my portfolio company was really uh, diluted early on. In fact, the first round, um, because they weren't, they, didn't have, they weren't educated enough, I guess. Um, they weren't exposed enough to how many percent they have to give up. And usually when that happens, it actually hurt them in the long run, right? Because eventually it will um, turn some investors away later on. So obviously when that happens, you gotta, you got to redistribute the shares from the option pool, I guess. Later on, in later rounds, there's something that you and your early stage investors have to plan. Because at the end of the day, this is a long game, right? In order to gain venture returns, you have to have up rounds, you have to, this, yeah. How much do you think founders should be aiming for, uh, for themselves as well as for the ESOP pool? I think earlier you have mentioned also that, you know, this is also an opportunity for founders that are starting out to raise slightly larger for their ESOP pools, or set aside larger amounts for their ESOP pools. Pardon? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, how much do you think founders should be setting aside for their ESOP pools as well as for themselves? I guess they can um, set aside 10% for ESOP pool every round. Um, and then obviously based on the company performance, they can set a KPI based um, ESOP allocation. And obviously the ESOP is vested and so I think, yeah, that's the most fair. I think to have a KPI based. And eventually that will incentivize them to actually perform better as well, right? Maybe we can, ooh, time is up. Okay. That was quick. <laughs> uh, do we have time for Q&A or absolutely no? One minute. Okay, let's just take, uh, we have two questions uh, from the audience. So first question is, what are the key metrics that will help startups raise funding today versus nine months ago? Anybody? Jessica? Yeah, I mean, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about this one. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's, a higher premium now on profitability than there is. Not, not to say that top line growth is not important. It is still important, but there is a, a, a bigger premium on profitability. I, you know, I will say if, we, if I think about 2023, what will define 2023, I, I would describe the year that we're entering as sort of the year of right sizing. Right sizing in terms of valuation. I mean, when you, investing is, is two ways. It's a partnership, it's a marriage. It needs to work both ways. And I think previously there was a lot of optimizing for the highest valuation and that wasn't necessarily a good thing. Maybe it makes you feel very good as a founder when you, you, know, when you have the deal signed and the money's in the bank, but then you spend the next several months basically trying to chase your own valuation. And that can also be a very, very scary thing. I think there's gonna be a right sizing of valuation in terms of, of round size as well too. I'm kind of in between some of the comments here. You should raise, I think you should raise a little bit more than you need, but not much more, so that you force yourself to have discipline, you, 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 you sort of right size dilution as well too. And so if I, if I look at this year, I think I would define it as this is gonna be the year of, of right sizing. Last comments from the panel? I think to add to that, I just, I think a couple of years ago, we, a lot of, uh, a lot of founders were actually starting companies to actually fundraise with, because they knew they were able to fundraise. I think we're not in that stage anymore. I think now the, I think now investors are actually looking for companies that um, that's actually solving a problem. So I think it's good that as Jessica said, it's right, we're right sizing and we're going back to basics. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Please give a warm applause for our panelists. Thank you very much.